Welcome back to uh, talk about yoga philosophy, theology, what is it, what is it not. And today I want to talk to you about the eight limbs of yoga. If that is a completely new topic to you, <laughs> that's totally fine. If you have done yoga for a while, if you've tried to do, go to yoga studio or done a yoga teacher training, most likely you would, would have uh, been acquainted to, to these eight limbs of yoga. They are written in the Yoga Sutras. I have a big mess of books here. <laughs> yoga Sutras. This is just one, one version of the Yoga Sutras. They are written by Patanjali. Um, and we actually don't know if this is his name or whatever, uh, back around three to 400 after Christ. Sutras means threats. So it was a way of writing where actually omitted or did not write, I would say almost half of the words in a sentence. Scholars think that this style of writing was popular and also in use because those who then read the 100 and 96 in this case, sutras, they would be disciples of Patanjali or the, the guru and they would know what he was talking about. So the sutras were just kind of reminder. Now, of course, we are challenged today <laughs> when we read this because if you have only half the sentence because some of the words are cut out, how do we know if we understand the, the word or the sentence right? Um, so now this is, you see, this is a book the majority of this is interpretation of each of the sutras. So if you just take the 196, 95 uh, sutras, they would just like mean, I mean 10 pages in this book and then you would be through. But you would not understand a thing. <laughs> so, so this is an interesting thing. Okay, back to the eight limbs. They are mentioned here. And eight limbs, uh, or like a, a pathway, so to say, back then in, in yoga sutras time and age was very common. You find this in other schools and the, uh, philosophy books during that time. This was not the only one that uh, spoke about yoga and all these things at, at that time. It was widely popular, uh, scholars think, because you have a lot of um, handwritings of it. You find different places but it kind of went out of fashion five, six, seven hundred years after it was written. So, uh, so it's only the British that actually came up and found it again in the 18th century and thought, oh, this is great. And that is why it's become so popular because they found it and looked at it and said, this is the one. They might as well have found something else, but they found this one. And they thought it made sense, and now it made sense to a lot of people today. <laughs> but I think it's around 30 of these sutras uh, is written about the, these eight limbs. They're very, very well known. Now, they consist of eight kind of rules or guidelines. And let me just walk you through it very briefly. You would often start with yamas and niyamas. They are ethical ways of living like uh, virtues, like non-stealing, uh, being non-violent, uh, devoted to your spiritual journey and stuff like that. So it's actually really great <laughs> living advice, I would say. And a lot of people, the Christian community that loves yoga, they take this and say, this is kind of like the Ten Commandments. Not all of it, but, but some of it is. So just ways of living. Is that yoga? Yes. <laughs> In the yoga philosophy, this is also yoga. Then the third one is asanas. And often asanas today is interpreted as postures. Back then, it was actually just interpreted, or it means take a seat. So you would simply sit down, prepare yourself for what's coming up next. The next fourth one is pranayama. And that's a breathing control, actually, <laughs> not breathing exercises as we often use today and, and interpret it today, but breath control. So thought is that life is in the breath, interestingly enough, and if you control breath, you also control life. That was some of the ideas in some of this. So breathing is a huge deal in yoga philosophy, and that goes all, actually all the way back to early philosophy in the Vedic texts. And you have something that then becomes a little bit more what is the difference? Um, and I'm not going to try to 
act like I know how to pronounce this, okay? Sorry. <laughs> Pratyahaya, which is control of the senses. So when you sit down, prepare yourself for meditation. You have to control your senses, not to be distracted by the noise of the car, by the fly coming by, uh, by the pain <laughs> in your legs or your back after sitting a lot, stuff like that. So controlling your physical senses would be the next one. Then Dahaya and Dhyana, which is more uh, concentration and then uh, meditation. A little bit hard to, to distinguish, but concentration, the which is the, the sixth one, is finding that stillness, that focus on something. Whereas meditation um, is also a, a bit of it, but you might, concentration might be focusing your sole attention on a light, candlelight in this case, it's often used. So when you are completely absorbed by looking into that light, then you're actually meditating. Uh, which is the seventh state, and then you enter into the blissed state, which is called samadhi, the state of relief of pain, <laughs> and the state of what you might call enlightenment. I was confused in the beginning with samadhi. Was it like a state when you entered into that, then you were there forever and, and <laughs> the rest of eternity or what? Most scholars would say that it is a state that you go into and out of. So when you sit and meditate, you follow these eight paths, you clear your, your conscience, you act well, you sit down, you breathe, start to meditate. And then eventually when you're in meditation, you're not aware of your meditate, that you're meditating anymore, you will be in this blissful state where you don't have suffering or conscious about anything else. You will be, some would say, connected to the divine this is actually not what Patanjali was talking about, I would say, but um, some interpret it like that. Now then what? What is that inspirational for, for, your, for uh, a follower of Christ today? I would say that uh, following this path when I'm going to sit down and meditate makes a lot of sense, right? I'm sitting down, <laughs> I'm focusing my breath, I'm concentrating, all of that. But... The eight limbs start with the actions. I have to get my life in order before I can start meditating. Just think back. There was this guru, had this school. There were only wealthy, royal men, boys, that came to this sage, this wise man, to be taught by this wise man. So don't think if as a, as a school with hundreds of kids, there were probably just a handful taught by this older man <laughs> and they were listening to his words and trying to do what he was saying um, and and he began by saying get your act together that makes a lot of sense and then you will eventually if you practice enough if you live your life full on and actually this is not you have to like live in a monastery to make this happen it was not something you went to on and off <laughs> like that anyway um what I think is the big difference in the Christian faith is that we don't start by acting, getting our things together and, and being good people. No, our path, or at least I believe so, the path starts with a version of samadhi. The path starts with finding your peace through grace, through God's love for you, for me. <laughs> So it begins with a thought about salvation and a state where you kind of say that heaven is not on earth. I mean, there's a lot of bad things happening here. As I define heaven, nothing bad happens there. But there is drops of heaven coming down when I find out what my purpose in life is, when I connect to God. Oh God, now God connects to me. So there is a starting point called Salvation, if you will. And from that, you are asked to, get, <laughs> to start acting good, to start not being violent, to start not stealing, start uh, becoming not envy, to follow your, your path, your calling, uh, pray and all of that. But that's after the first bit of samadhi. And then you might be able to use this path, this eight limbs, to, to find more 
bliss or more calmness listen to God in the stillness of the meditation uh, and then eventually go to the heavenly afterlife samadhi if you will um, uh, when, when, you're, when we're dead right so my take on it is that it is in a Christian life it, it begins with the samadhi and then we take the action whereas in yoga philosophy we would often start with the actions and then you make your way into a version of, of salvation I hope this makes sense. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on all of this. <laughs> so let me know right in the comments. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share these videos. That's so helpful. And um, if you want to know more, this is just a brief introduction. You can find Learning Crush Yoga at any Amazon store nearby you, online store. Uh, it's a lot about yoga philosophy and all that, and also about how to teach uh, yoga uh, with the Christian perspective, if you're interested in that. All right, thank you so much for following me. I hope you have seen all the videos here. Uh, and uh, I'll be back with more topics on, uh, on things like this. Thank you so much.